I want to thank Pastor Mark Ramsey so much for opening God's house here uh, in beautiful Mansfield. Welcome. If this is your first time to this church, um, I am so thrilled uh, to see a full house in this building. And uh, I really hope that no matter what degree of knowledge uh, that you have with God today or you've known of Him but you don't know Him, I just pray that uh, tonight's testimony and the preaching of the gospel draws you closer to Him. I am so, so honored to be a servant of the Most High God and I'm confident in His power and His love um, until death. And I am thrilled to share with you how He changed my life and um, I was born in Australia, in Melbourne, and then at 12 years old, we moved to Brisbane. And then at 23, God tapped me on the shoulder and said, it's time for you to go around the world and be based out of California. I'd like to share with you a family photo. Um, this is my family. Her name is Kanae, me and my wife. We've been married now uh, for seven years. Yep, there she is. And um, we have... Uh, we have four children, our hands are full. Uh, Kiyoshi on the left, his six. Dayan on the right, his three. And then Olivia and Ali, there's another photo now of a close-up. They're now 17 months old, which is so incredible. Um, they're darling, they're beautiful. And God willing, um, this year, at the end of this year, or, or next year will be the year that they all come with me to Australia. And I am really, really thankful. Oh yeah, there's the big screen. Sure, you wanna rewind then for the other one real quick? I mean, it's not hard to look at, right? So we've got, so Kane, she's half Japanese, half Mexican. We call that Japsican. Um, that's better. And then the next photo. Um, and then real quickly, so, since we're doing some photos, that's Olivia and Ellie. And, um, I'll be seeing in a couple of weeks, but um, really quickly, I want to thank, there are, I know there are people in this room who prayed for me. Um, I know last time I came, it was 06, but I don't know if anybody knows this, but it was around 2003 that I tried to actually rent out this room uh, to then have a camera crew and record me speaking to record a DVD that goes around the world. And I paid for finger food for 2,000 people and we had 100 people rock up and none of the footage could be used. And God used that in this building, check this out, to say it's time to go to America. And on the way out of this building, right over there, there was a woman who came up and she said, God's gonna use you to reach one billion souls. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> I wanna show you this photo. This is in Ukraine. Um, this is in September 2017. There are 800,000 people there. 400,000 gave their life to Jesus. But um, <laughs> if you paid attention to the numbers of the video, um, by the grace of God, we have reached 730 million with the gospel. And this is how we do it, by the grace of God. Not only were there 800,000 people there, but 26 countries were watching at the same time in 20 languages. So we actually preached the gospel to 52.7 million people in a day. Um, and so we are so thankful. And I just wanna say thank you to anyone here in this room who I know that you prayed for me since I started at age 19. And real quickly, one last photo. Um, April 2017 was the year that I got to talk to the 10th government I was able to talk to. This time, though, was pretty significant. As you can see, this is everyone but the president in Ukraine, okay? Um, this is the Senate, the House of Representatives. Can you notice they're not on their chairs, they're on their knees? And while they were on national live TV, they asked God to forgive Ukraine of their sins and to heal their land and to help the government honor God in everything they do. You know, I love it when people see me for the first time and they look at me with no arms and legs and they say, but you're different. I just want you to know I'm not, and not from two different angles, but to understand that God can use any willing heart. If God can use a man without arms and legs to be his hands and feet, then God can use certainly anyone. Can you hear an amen? amen. And I want you to know that I actually believe it's worse being in a broken home than having no arms and legs. 
And the beautiful thing, I want to tell you a couple things before I get into it. The beautiful thing about our history is if you break that word up to his story. And when he is the author and perfecter of your faith, I had no idea that God would send me around the world to reach millions of people. When I was born, they had no idea that I was going to be born this way. And, you know, the doctor said that I wouldn't walk. And the doctor said I wouldn't go to school. Not only did I go to school, but I can now type 53 words a minute on a normal computer after two cups of coffee. I went to Griffith University at Logan Campus, got a double degree in accounting and financial planning, went into the stock market, went into real estate, and then went to California. And I want you to know something that in my life, Many people look at me, and first of all, I want you to know it's not about what I did with my broken pieces. So many people say, well, all you need is just to be positive. I feel like headbutting them in the face. <laughs> I'm a positive person because I know the truth, and the truth has set me free. The truth of three things, the truth of my identity and value, the truth of my purpose, and the truth that God does have a plan for me. And it's a good plan and not a bad plan. Jeremiah 29 verse 11, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Can you turn me down a little bit, please? Thank you so much. And what I want you to know is that we all have broken pieces. And when I was a kid going to school, I never thought that when you didn't get a miracle that you could still be a miracle for someone else. And I want you to understand that in your history, through your broken pieces, there's nothing that we can do with our regret, our pain, our fear, our anxiety, our addictions, the loss in our life, um, all these things. We can't do anything with that. But when you give your broken pieces in the hands of the one who can do all things, that's where miracles happen. And I'll never ever forget that when I was 24 years old, I saw a little boy with no arms and no legs in a crowd in California, just like me little foot and everything. And I'm looking at him and I'm like, wow, I want to wrestle him later on. And he's looking up at me and, and I'm looking down at him and I give him a high five and I can't give him a, I'm sorry, I can't give him a high five. So I gave him a low two. And it was so awesome. He was smiling. Everyone was crying. His mom came up and she hugged me. I mean, can you imagine when I was at school in Melbourne, Australia, getting bullied and teased in depression, attempted suicide at age 10? How much of a miracle that would have been for me if I met a 36-year-old man who has no arms and no legs, who's a speaker, a wife and four kids, and the joy of the Lord. How much of a miracle that would be if that my parents met another set of parents who had children like me. And when we didn't get that miracle, we could be that miracle. And I'm telling you, man, I can't wait to go to heaven. Not for arms and legs, but for the devil to be done. Every power and principality and power of darkness to be done, number one. To see Jesus all in that. I love that. I can't wait to see Jesus. But man, this little boy, Daniel, I went to his school. He was getting bullied and teased. And so I went to his school in my wheelchair and I ran them all over. <laughs> no, I didn't. That's not what Jesus would do. But I went to his school and I didn't run over anyone deliberately. And I spoke there about love and no one teased anyone. In fact, that school and two other schools in America have a Nick Vujicic holiday where bullying stopped altogether. And I want you to know that now as a guy, looking back, I want you to know that if you've had an alcoholic, abusive father, I don't know how that feels. And I'm sorry that you had an alcoholic, abusive father. But if we really believe in Jesus and we find the truth, the truth would set us free in our value, our purpose and our destiny in Him. And we can help someone else who's depressed or even suicidal because of their alcoholic, verbally abusive or whatever abusive father. And you can tell them, hey, I know how that feels, but Jesus has a plan. Hold on to God and God will take your broken pieces and do something beautiful because that's what he did with me. I'm no different than you. And we all have different things on the outside and circumstances, but it's the disabilities of the heart. And when you go by faith and not by sight, when you look at that word disabled, D-I-S-A-B-L-E-D, you put a G-O in front of it and it spells God is abled. <laughs> to do what? 
<laughs> Ephesians 3.20, he can do exceedingly abundantly more than you can ever ask, imagine, or attain. When I was a kid, I went to school and all the kids would look at me. Hey, real quick, put your hand up if you've never heard me speak face to face. Awesome. Put your hand up. Put your hand up if you have. Let me see the other hand. Okay, cool. 60-40. Ready? So sometimes kids will look at me and they'll be like, what happened? I just tell them cigarettes. And, <laughs> and I used to go to school and I come home and I say, mom and dad, I don't want to go to school. Why not? Because they're teasing me. Don't worry. God loves you. He's got a plan for you. You're special. And I'm like, I don't want to be special. I wanted arms and legs. And they're like, well, you know, just be yourself and, and God's going to help you along the way to make friends. So I took humor a little bit far in my adulthood as well because you know, I don't know if you've seen the YouTube video of me dressed up as the pilot greeting the passengers as they get on the plane. It was so awesome. I told them that we got some new technology. And, and as people were coming on, I was like, good morning. My name's Captain Nick Vujicic. Welcome aboard. <laughs> And then they were all on the plane, and then I walked on the plane like this, and you look down the aisle, and everyone's head's like this. <laughs> and so I got, the, I got the microphone, and I said, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for boarding this so fast. And they're like, oh my gosh, and all their heads like this. And some people gave their life to Jesus right there and then. <laughs> The funniest story, I was in a car one day with the, with the traffic lights and this girl's looking at me, I'm looking at her, all she sees is my head. So I just do this. And her face was like, so good. So my parents said, be thankful for what you have. It's hard to be thankful for what you have when everyone seems to have more. God has a plan. What's the plan? Can God do all things? Yes. Church, can God do all things? Yes. Do you know that I've actually seen 13 blind people, seeing deaf people, hearing lame people walk and crooked backs come straight. And in fact, in 2002 in Brisbane, I had an orthopedic surgeon uh, we had an MRI because I had kind of like a pinching of a nerve down my back. I couldn't feel my left arm. And I went to get an MRI <laughs> and he came out with the results and he said, I have some bad news. I said, what's the bad news? He said, you were born with a very rare disease. I said, yeah, I know that. He said, no, you have a hollowing in your spine. He said, it's a syrinx. I said, what's that? He said, by age 35, 45 years old, your spine is right now deteriorating. It's a degenerative rare disease where your spine turns into nothing. By age 35, 45, we're gonna put, have to put metal rods in your back and you'll be basically on your back and you won't be able to start, you won't be able to walk and you'll have to start living life differently. I had three holes in my spine. 2012, I was already in California, I got a checkup. 2002, three holes. 2012, two holes. And the doctor's like, this is a syrinx. I know what this is, but I have no idea how we went from three holes to two. And I'm like, mm-hmm. Two years later, one hole. Nine months later, no holes. But that's not going to change your life. You're not going to go home and say, well, I can't believe that God healed his back. But I want you to know, I've seen miracles. The reason why I'm not an atheist is because I have been gone. I have been traveling on 2,500 planes, 5 million kilometers. It's only 36,000 kilometers around the world. Try 5 million kilometers. 700 cities, half a million hugs, my arms fell off. And when you go to those cities where there's no medical stuff and someone has cancer, I've met the family that has a witch doctor and they had cancer and then they do a ceremony with the blood of animals and you see voodoo, witchcraft, black magic. It's real and science can't explain it. And when you see a demon, you ain't atheist after that. 
That's why I'm not an atheist, because I know what I've seen, and I've seen the power of God, and I've also seen the dark side that science can't explain. But this bigger question of God's plan for me, number one question, if God loves us, why is there pain in the world? God, then if you also can change my circumstance, then give me arms and legs. Do you see my Bible up on this stage? This is the journey of my life. Encouragement that brings me closer to what God wants for my life, His ways, His thoughts, His plans, His strength. But then the lies that take you away, heaven, hell, God, the devil. You're ugly. You'll never be anybody. Just give up. God's not real. You'll never get married. Even if you got married, you can't even hold your wife's hand. Even if you got kids, you can't even hold your kids when they're crying. You're never going to get a job, nothing. You're just a burden to everyone. And that's when I attempted suicide at age 10. I hung around for a couple of more years wondering to see what would happen. And my life started changing at age 13. I was playing soccer and I was on the field. And my friend here in Brisbane kicked the ball to me. And you know when something's coming for you and it doesn't matter what you do, you're dead? <laughs> I had that feeling. So I jumped up in the air and I did this karate kick kick in the air and my foot bent on itself backwards and I heard a <laughs> And I was like <laughs> And my foot went oh. And I'm like, I need this! And I'm on my bed looking at the ceiling, I'm thinking, man, I'm going to be starting to be thankful for my little foot instead of being angry for what I don't have. Do you know the happiest people of all are those who are thankful, who understand that heaven is real and that you can even be thankful when your mom dies or when your dad dies. My dad died two years ago of cancer at 63. My first cousin died at 27. My other first cousin's first son died within two days. For every person that is born, dies, in case you didn't know. And I want you to know that we are not supposed to be here forever, that yes, heaven is real and my arms and legs are waiting up there and I wanted to believe in heaven. I wanted to believe I'm a citizen of heaven passing through. I wanted to believe that Jesus died for my sins because I knew that no matter how hard I tried, I know that I can't be someone who steals something and not be called a thief. Someone who lies once and then not be called a liar. Someone who sins once and not be called a sinner. I knew I was a sinner. I knew that I couldn't go to heaven because only perfection was there up there waiting for me. But how am I going to get up there on my own merit? I wanted to believe in Jesus. I wanted to believe in heaven. But I wanted logic. Faith in God is actually extremely logical. And I want you to know something. I'm going to explain to you my journey of the questions. Ready? Question number one. If God is a God of love, then why is there pain? When we read in the Bible, Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. They had no pain. They had no death. They had no disability and sickness. Are you with me? Then when the snake came in and he said something different than God and they believed him, that's when all that stuff came. Are you with me? Okay. Then the second logical question is, if God is a loving God, then he knew all these bad things would happen because he allowed the serpent in. Then why did he allow the serpent in the Garden of Eden? Good question. Here's the answer. As you read the Word of God, God gives three things to Adam and Eve. He gives them life, He gives them hope, and He gives them free choice. If God didn't allow the serpent in the Garden of Eden, I could intellectually argue that God never gave Adam and Eve free choice. He had to present a choice for them to choose. Otherwise, they never had a choice. Are you with me? 
So then, how did that all happen? And here until now, wait a second, Nick, what about all the people that I know who are really good people? Why can't they go to heaven? That's my third question. Good question. So let's go to the extreme and go to the person who rapes my daughter. Should they be, and they're never sorry, should they be a neighbor of me in heaven? No. Why? Because that, that doesn't seem right, does it? It doesn't seem just. If we all are here and you can do whatever you want and we just go to the same place, there's no fairness in that. Do you agree? So then how good is good and how bad is bad? It's like you go to the grocery store, okay, and you get a product and you give it to the cashier and she gets your product and go, beep, five bucks comes up on the screen. What do you have to pay? Five bucks. You can give them five bucks and then you take the product and you walk out. You with me? If the product then goes, beep, five bucks, you give two bucks and you say, I hope it's enough. Guess what she's going to say? Sorry, buddy. Who sets the rules? Someone who set the rules says, it's five bucks, you don't have five bucks, okay, good. Eternal life product, beep, metaphorically speaking. The wages of sin is death. Adam and Eve didn't have to die until they sinned. In the Old Testament, they sacrificed animals for the atonement of sin of the, with the blood of the animal. And then Jesus came, New Testament, died once and for all. Now, if me and Mark are friends here in Brisbane and I'm driving in Brisbane and then I go speeding and then a cop pulls me over and gives me a $500 fine because I'm speeding and Mark pays the fine, then I'm good to go. Yes? When I get the product of eternal life, death, Jesus comes up and says, I'll pay for that. And he, if he had sin in his life, then he would have to die for his sin. But he was perfect. This is how Jesus set himself apart from everyone else. He said he was God. He was perfect. He raised other people from the dead. He died for my sins and he rose again. I love the fact about this life that we can choose to believe in whatever we want. I can believe in this table if I want. And I'll tell you, when I was 12 years old in Melbourne, a woman came up to me in the airport. She said, were you born this way? I said, yes. She said, have you ever wondered why? I said, yes. She said, well, I know why. And I'm thinking, interesting, a stranger's gonna tell me why I was born this way when my doctors don't know why I was born this way. My parents don't know why I was born this way. Lady Gaga don't know why I was born this way. And she said, you're a perfect example of reincarnation. And I said, what's that? She said, in your previous life, you were a very, very bad boy and now you're being punished. And I'm thinking, what do I say? Do I say thank you so much? <laughs> she said, but don't worry because in your next life, you're gonna come back like a butterfly. I'm thinking, that sucks. <laughs> do you know how many butterflies I've killed in my wheelchair? I don't wanna be a butterfly. And the amazing thing is this, is that as you go around the world, you get to see the other religions. And I want you to know, for me, I wanted to know, why was I born this way? And in John chapter nine, when I was 15, I read that scripture and I gave my life to Jesus. A man was born blind and Jesus was coming through the village with all these people around him, trying to test him and stuff. And some other people, disciples, and they came up and they asked Jesus, Jesus, why was he born that way? Was it because that he sinned that he was born that way? Wait a second, does that sound like reincarnation? Or was it that his parents sinned that made him this way? He said, neither of that. It was done so that the works of God would be revealed through him. Jesus spits in the dirt, puts the mud on his face, and when they're done with the facial, he sees. What changed me was that Jesus didn't sit the blind man down and say, hey, my name's JC, I'm the healer, and we're gonna put mud on your face, and when we're done, you're gonna see. That's not what happened. He is still. Can you imagine being blind? And then you hear a thum, <laughs> and then someone starts to put mud on your face. You're like, hey, whoa, 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 time out. He didn't do that. Be still and know that I am 
God. And at 15, I said, God, you healed the blind man. Heal me, please. Give me arms and legs. If you give me arms and legs, I'll go all around the world and I'll tell the whole world that you live. I'll go and meet presidents. I'll go on Oprah Winfrey show. Guys, I've already met 18 presidents. I've already been on the Oprah Winfrey show. And you know what the coolest thing is? What I tell them, I believe they believe me. Why? Because when they see a man without arms and legs, the way he is, with the joy that the world can't understand, with the strength that the world can't understand. Now, do I have a pair of shoes in my closet just in case God says yes? <laughs> of course I do. I do. It would be really cool. <laughs> but if He doesn't, that's okay because in our existence, we have our soul, spirit, mind, then body. We're always looking for the tangible things. Any eight, nine, ten year olds at the front, give me, give me a wave, you're eight, nine, ten. Awesome. Can you guys just stand up? You're all eight, nine, ten. I love that. All right, look at me here. Don't come up on stage, because they'll tackle you. But look at me, ready? This is yes and this is no, okay? Are you ready? Okay. We are always looking for different things in our life to change before we're not stressed. Okay, ready? Here's the question to the eight, nine, 10 year olds up the front, ready? Yes, no, ready? Have you ever, ever, ever in your life been stressed? Good, sit down, thank you so much. Ask them what they were stressed about. Oh, homework is so hard. And my parents, they didn't give me everything I want. And my siblings, they annoy me every single day. I want to be 13. Then you talk to a 13 year old, they're like, oh, I don't even know who I am anymore. I need my privacy. I thought I could trust my friends and then they backstab me. They invite me to the party, then they uninvite me to the party. I'm so stressed. I need a boyfriend. <laughs> if I could just be 17, then everything's gonna be okay. Nah, man, you talk to 17 year olds. Oh, I gotta get the OP and then get to university. And then if I get to university, then everything's okay. You get to university, what do you now need? A job. God, give me a job. Please give me a job. If I just get a job, then everything's gonna be okay. You finally get your job. And after two days, <laughs> you look at your boss in the face and you think, I hate you. <laughs> and then all the single people, Oh, when I finally find the one, then everything's going to be okay. No. Go talk to the married people. They'll tell you if you ain't happy single, you ain't going to be happy married. Can you hear an amen? Those are the married people. So what is it? Teenagers, listen very closely. Uh, Jake, if I can have you play keys up here, I'll play keys, but I'm not warmed up yet. <laughs> Teenagers, look at me for a second. We go to school and we say the F word to be cool and this group and that group and all that deal. And we kind of do what everyone else does and you know, we work on our biceps. Man, my biceps are so big they fell off, you understand me? <laughs> Well, you know, I'm a Christian, but you know, I'm okay to say the F word for now, right? Is that okay? Well, actually, black and white, it's written in the Bible, saying the F word and bad language is a sin. In fact, if you study Peter when he denied Jesus, the first time he was asked, do you know Jesus? He said, no. The second time, do you know Jesus? He said, no. Do you know what he did differently on the third time to convince people? He used the F word. Just because everyone else around you is doing it doesn't mean it's okay. Sex is made for marriage, not before marriage, not even outside of marriage, in marriage. That's how God made sex, for marriage. And I want you to know something. Oh, I go to church with my boyfriend or my girlfriend and we love the Lord and I know we're going to marry each other. Good, then get married. 
My tween girls are never going to be looking for a boyfriend. They will be looking for a husband. They will be looking for a man of God. They will be looking for a man of God. And you want to know how I will know if he's a man of God? How he treats my daughter. And if he cannot hold and abstain and wait till marriage, it is a dishonour before the Lord. And my sisters, if he cannot honour God before you get married, how do you think he honours God once you get married? Money, drugs, sex, alcohol, pornography, fame and fortune. If you put your happiness in temporary things, your happiness will be temporary. When you're a speaker in front of 650 sex slaves sold into slavery for $700, some sold by their own mother, what do you tell them about hope? My question tonight, Brisbane, is do you have hope? What is it? And if you have it, if it's real, it may better fit in for everyone. Equal opportunity for hope if it's real. Do you not agree? So what do we tell these girls? Be positive. Reincarnation, better luck next time. Be good, do good, good's gonna happen. I'm not a Christian because someone told me to be a Christian. I'm a Christian because I did my research. He called my heart. I responded. I'm not gonna tell these girls, be X, Y, Z. I'm not gonna name religions, but listen very carefully. Can you imagine that I've done my research now, especially evangelizing in 70 countries to 8.5 million people? One religion that I can't tell them to be is do this religion. All you need to do is keep 660 commandments. Hopefully you get in. That's one big religion. I'm struggling personally with 10. Another religion, actually their own national religion where I was at, already makes sex slaves or prostitutes or even disabled people already an outcast. Another religion is that all you need is not 660, forget about that, 400 400 rules only. And, 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 and then if, if you want to fast track, just kill that person from that religion and you'll get a fast track. No joke, major, major religion. In 03, no one knows this here in Australia. I went to Southeast Asia, 60,000 people gave their life to Jesus Christ. We got an email from someone saying, if you ever come back to my country and we see another 60,000 people give their life to Jesus Christ in a week, I personally will kill you. Two years later, 05, went back to that country. Now the 60,000 people gave their life to Jesus Christ. Got an email from the guy who said, I came there to kill you, but I gave my life to Jesus Christ instead. And I saw these girls find Jesus and you go through this amazing rehab and 12 months later, they're redeemed. They're new. They know the truth of their value. They know the truth of, of, of their purpose and they know the truth that God has a plan. And you know what happens after 12 months? They find a job, not for a car, not for a house, not for nothing. They save up 700 bucks and they go back to the brothels where they were once a slave with a bucket of water and a white towel and they knock on the door of the house where they used to be one of six slaves in that house and the pimp opens up the door and says, who are you? She says, I used to be your slave. You used to abuse me, but I found Jesus. And I want you to know that you have everything on the outside. Your body is good. You have health. You might think that you give money to charity sometimes, which actually they do to make sometimes themselves feel better, but your soul is lost. And I'm praying for your soul. And I found Jesus and He forgave me of everything I've done wrong and He made me new. And I've been praying for you and I forgive you. What? I forgive you. He forgave me of everything. Who am I not then to forgive you of the sins against me? 
I'm going to wash your feet. And they wash their feet. Then he's 700 bucks. Give me another 10 year old. I'm taking her home. They adopt that little girl. She finds Jesus. They get a job together. They save and rescue another one and another one and another one and another one. If that's not redemption, if that's not redemption, you know what the last reason is why people don't give their life to Jesus? It's this last thing I'm going to tell you. It's Nick, it can't, it can't be that God can just forgive my sin. It's too easy. Well, let me ask you, if I give you a million dollar check, are you going to complain about going to the bank to cash it in? But you don't know what it took for me to get the million bucks? We're talking about the sacrifice of Jesus. It's a gift. He did it all to receive. We receive. No, Nick, you have no idea I have too much sin. No, no, no. After the 650 slaves went to a house about this width of a house and a woman on the floor, no joke. She's like this sitting down and she's tremoring and she's hunched back like this and all the, all the gods on the wall that they're burning incense to and stuff. And I'm talking to her about Jesus and she's listening and she can't even do this. She's like this, sitting on the floor. Bones, skin and bone, nothing. All, 90, 100, 110, I would believe you. And all of a sudden, this beautifully dressed up woman comes in, crossing her arms like this. <laughs> Who are you? I said, uh, I'm Nick. What do you want? I'm here to talk about Jesus. She said, I'm sick of you white people coming in here talking about this Jesus. You can't even show me His power. Get out of my house right now. We had cameras with us too. Get out of my house right now with your cameras. Leave right now or show me the power of God. This video is about to come out on YouTube this year, guys. And this is what happens. I said, what do you mean? Show me His power. She said, do you see that woman? She's my sister. See that door? She hasn't walked out that door for four and a half years. Look at her. She's frail. She's dying. If He's real, show me. Make her walk now. So I said a little prayer to God. I said, God, just in case you're not aware of what's going on, (laughs) I'm about to pray for this woman who apparently hasn't walked for four and a half years. You know I've seen 12 miracles, so you're not testing my faith. You know I have faith. Please come. We pray. And they said, get up in the name of Jesus. And she couldn't walk. I said, no, let's pray again. We're praying again, sitting on a chair. And all of a sudden, she went like this, in a second to this. Whoa. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and she said in a language, electricity, electricity, electricity. Her hunchback was gone. Wow. Her tremor was gone. Her eyes were sharp, looking right into me. I'm like, awesome. <laughs> she said, let me walk. And you know what I said? No, no, no. We need to pray a little bit longer. <laughs> Isn't that funny? The evangelist prays for the paralyzed woman and she says she's ready and the evangelist says, no. (laughs) You know what that means? I had a mustard seed of faith, guys. A mustard seed of faith. That's all you need. You can put oceans of faith in your intellect, in your next relationships, in your bank account, in your real estate investments, in blah, 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 blah. I can't care less because stuff fails you. People fail you, but God never fails. Does God always heal a paralyzed woman? No. Does God always heal a limbless body? No. Does God always heal someone with cancer? No, because in the end, we go home. And His grace is sufficient, but that day, she got healed. And she started jumping up and down on these skinny little legs. I'm thinking, Honey, don't break the legs that God just healed, all right? That's abuse right there. And she's crying and punching in the air. And the friend who took me there, he said, I can't believe it. I said, what? He said, I didn't want to tell you who that woman was. I said, who was she? He said, probably the most woman you'll ever meet in your life. I said, who who was she? What did she do? 
He said, you know, the 250 houses that I showed you where all the slaves are, 250. I said, yeah. In the 1960s, all of that city block was nothing. She started that. She started human trafficking. She's probably responsible for at least 40,000 slaves. She was the one who recruited the kidnappers. 40,000 slaves later, and a limbless man from Australia prays for her before she knows what's going on. Our loving, compassionate God that has no bounds of love, no sin can separate you from the love of God. He healed her. And two weeks later, not then, not the next day, not the next day, it took her two weeks to give her life to Jesus Christ. And when she asked Jesus to come into her heart, did He? Yes, because He came for the lost. And when she asked for the forgiveness of the sins that she's done, did God forgive church? Yes, He did even better. The Bible says He forgives and forgets. So what sin do you have? Pornographic addiction? You think that's going to stop God's love for you? Eh, wrong lie. What lies do you believe in? You can say to those lies, talk to the foot because the ears ain't listening. And you turn around and say, I don't want that stuff. I don't want to sin anymore. I don't want my plan. I want your plan. I don't want my strength. I want your strength. I don't want my intellect. I want your plan, your wisdom, your strength, your endurance, your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness, your Holy Spirit. Help me, God, to believe in these next verses. Romans 8, 28. All things come together for the good for those who love Him, who have been called according to His purposes. Isaiah 40, verse 31. Those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength that shall mount up on wings like eagles. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And let the peace of God that surpasses all understanding guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. I have seven or eight verses that I know off by heart because when I go through storms as a Christian, when I go through depression sometimes as a Christian, I couldn't care less if the Prime Minister is Christian or not. I wonder how many Christians actually in Australia read this from Monday to Saturday. I wonder how many Australians know how to pray for more than three minutes. I don't speak in tongues. Not putting it down. Do you pray? Some of you teenagers think you're Christian because you go to church on Sunday and then you tease and gossip at school on Monday. You don't know God. It's time. When you go to sleep tonight and if you don't wake up here, Ah, you saved. I am. I am. I will be there. Will you? Tonight, I want to give you an opportunity to respond. To say, Yes, God. Forgive me of my sin. I am a sinner. Come into my life and fill me with your Holy Spirit. I don't want my plan. I want yours. I know I'll never be perfect. 
But I know your love never changes. And as you hunger and strive, He will help you one day at a time. Do you know Him? Or do you just text Him when you need Him? Do you have Jesus in your house as a guest? You put Him in this nice little room upstairs and you go and see Him three times a year or once a week and you kind of talk to Him mostly when you need Him. What kind of a friendship is that? Do you have a friendship with Jesus? What a friend we have in Jesus, but have we engaged that friendship Because for as long as we own our lives, we lose it. For as long as you hold the key to the front door of your house, when the devil comes knocking, the guest of your house never opens the door. It is the owner. For as long as you are the owner, when the devil comes knocking, you'll be opening. But when you give the key to Jesus and say, Jesus, I want you. I live for you. I'm done living for me. Here is the key. Lead me, guide me. I'm out of the driver's seat. Drive me, take me, help me, heal me. Take my depression, take my anxiety. Some of you 48 year old women are still disabled by what your father told you when you were nine years old. You haven't gotten Christian counseling yet. You can't just pray things away. You need counseling and surrender to God every single day. It's it's understanding that it starts with the soul and the spirit and the mind, but it starts, give him the key. He didn't come for the healed, He came for the broken.